This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's the place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. So welcome aboard, folks. This is Dr. Charles Parker, and we're very pleased to have a guest today that's going to talk about something that is so often misrepresented, not thoroughly understood, and lived with for years without having anybody take a look at it, and that is the nuances and the issues around chronic pain. So our guest today is Sarah Ann Shockley, and she has had some very significant pain experiences herself. She's coming at us from a person who's experienced and is involved in recovery. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on board. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Chuck. I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you. So before we get started, I'll just do a couple words from our sponsor, and then I'll formally introduce Sarah in just a moment. Core Brain Journal is sponsored by Great Plains Laboratory. They are deep international biomedical testing leaders for improved targeted mind science details. As both laboratory and webinar global thought leaders, they provide the most comprehensive set of hard data measurement tools for real biomedical answers beyond simple guesswork. They also provide multiple training webinars for both the public and medical providers on how to use that data effectively. Check out their website for references and testing details. And take note on this, folks. What they're doing, Great Plains is offering free testings. So you want to make sure you go to this site and see if you qualify for a testing and make sure what's going on. Now, this week, the test is for immunoglobulin G, IgG. We've talked a lot about it on uh, YouTube and a lot of videos, and it's definitely our favorite number one test. It's so often happens, and by the way, it's so relevant for chronic pain. So what happens is this week is IgG, as I said, and it has answers for simple. You can get IgG from a simple blood test, and that will be at HTTP, greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash CBJ, Core Brain Journal, CBJ. Why not jump on it right now? So let me tell you a little bit about Sarah. She's the author of The Pain Companion, folks. In the fall of 2007, she contracted thoracic outlet syndrome, which a lot of you don't know about, which we're really going to be excited to talk to you about because it is so pervasive out there and so frequently overlooked. And it's a collapse of the area between the clavicles and the first ribs. We'll talk more. Sarah will tell us all about it. And she lived with debilitating nerve pain ever since. She's been a regular columnist for Pain News Network and is a regular contributor to the mighty 1.5 million member online community for those living with chronic illness and pain. She comes to us from the beautiful San Francisco Bay Area, and you can visit her online at thepaincompanion.com. I got chronic in there too much. Thepaincompanion.com, that's her website. So Sarah, that's great. Let's get started on this because we have some definite curiosity. And actually, as I was reading it, I'm thinking you might still be suffering with. Oh, yeah, I am. Okay, well. I've, you know, I've put, moved a lot of it. And we'll talk about how that happened. I'm looking I'm forward to it because I'm going to put my medical hat on and talk to you, girl. So this is going to be fun. All right. So let's go ahead. So how did you first discover that this was a thoracic outlet syndrome? And then how did you then take it down the path? Where did you go with that? Thank you. And I want to say I really appreciate being here because I do think we need to hear from people who are suffering from chronic pain as often as we hear from the medical community. And we don't always get that. So I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about my story and what I've learned from living with pain. So as you were saying, in the fall of 2007, what happened was I started to get pains in my hands using the computer. And I thought it was maybe carpal tunnel or something like that. And I started to get also some odd pains. I had uh, numbness in my left arm and I, then that would go away. They would kind of come in and go away and come in and go away. And finally, uh, one day, it just came on all at once, this incredible amount of pain in my neck. My back felt like it was going to seize up. My hands, my arms were hurting. It was like, boom, really big at once. And I was uh, very fortunate to find a doctor who led me to a neurologist here, Dr. Tracy Newkirk, who was familiar with thoracic outlet syndrome. I think he specializes in it. 
and he was able to diagnose me. And you are right. It's, it's little known. It's easily overlooked. It's kind of a, you kind of have to know what it is to, to find it. So I think a lot of people are probably suffering from it and don't know, you know, haven't mm -hmm. been correctly diagnosed. But it is, in fact, a collapse between the collarbones, the clavicles, and the first rib. And if listeners may not know, but in that area, you know quite well, rather large nerve ganglia has to go through on both sides. The, the scalene muscle from the neck comes through, artery veins. So there's a lot going through an already narrow space. And when it collapse, collapses, it squeezes all of that. So we're talking major pain and debilitation because it, it affects the use of the arms. It affects, it causes weakness, but it also causes a great deal of pain, tingling in the arms, numbness, terrible aches, kind of like an abscess in the, in the neck. I mean, the, the symptoms go on and on and on. So I basically almost overnight, my life stopped. It was so severe. I had it on both sides and on all, they talk about three levels of it. I had it on all of the levels on both sides. So I kind of managed to get a pretty severe case of it. And I did see a thoracic surgeon in San Francisco about the possibility of surgery. I'm not big on surgery myself. It's not my first thing that I would choose, but I wanted to go explore everything possible. And mm -hmm. he said, you're not a candidate for this surgery because of my condition is so severe. He said, it's just going to come back again. It's, and he spent two hours with me explaining physiologically what was going on. He was quite wonderful. And said the surgery was pretty intense and very long rehabilitation process, and it would probably just return in my case. So I was kind of went home with not a whole lot to work with. My body didn't work well. I could barely walk. I was walking kind of bent forward, you kind of stumbling. I mean, it really affects your whole mm -hmm. body. You have mm -hmm. it very, very severely. I couldn't drive very far. I was a single mom. And by days, for a long time, I was in such severe pain. I, I would kind of stumble out of bed in the morning and get breakfast for my son and take him to school and then come home and kind of recover from that for the rest of the day and go pick him up. And that went on for a year. And of course, I thought it was going away. I mean, everything goes away, right? It just gets better, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you step of course. Home, it gets better, <laughs> everything gets better. And I'd never had experience with something that didn't go away. So I just lived with it. I had to stop work, but I thought I'm just going to, you know, the body's going to heal and I'm going to carry on. And it was about almost a year into it, one of my doctors said to me, Sarah, this doesn't just go away. And in fact, it's progressive often, and it can get worse and worse and worse. And my neurologist said that, in fact, sometimes arms atrophy. I mean, it gets so bad. Well, that was depressing and yeah. frightening. And I went home with that news. And I had already tried some things to heal in terms of different physical therapies, whatever I could find. And they had mostly made things worse. They hadn't helped. And as you know, thoracic outlet syndrome is very tricky because whatever you do with your arms, you're kind of compressing more that area that's already compromised and the tissues are already swollen. So you kind of can't do much physically without making it worse. And it's hard to sleep and you have to keep moving around all night. So it's very tricky to try to heal this thing. And I had spent some time being upset with it and upset with myself and upset with the situation, but that wasn't helping either because becoming angry and becoming stressed out, boy, stress with thoracic outlet syndrome, I think probably with any chronic pain doesn't help at all. It just, the pain shoots through the roof. So I had to learn to become very calm, kind of Zen is what I think of it, you know, and just be really simple, which is not my way. I'm usually a very active person. And boy, having to just pull back and get calm and relax, that was really hard in itself. So finding out I was going to be with this for a long time, and they said the rest of my life, and it was probably going to get worse, I kind of went into stoic mode. You know, I had a kid mm -hmm. to take care of. I had to at least try to stay on the planet and do the minimum I could do. So I thought, okay, I'm not going to fight it. I'm going to just put up with it. I'm just going to live through it. And I thought that'll kind of handle things. I did that for at least five years. Um, really? Five? Oh, yeah. I've been in this oh, for 10 God. years. Oh, yeah. So I can totally relate to listeners out there that have been in pain for a long time. It's quite challenging. And there was a point where I said to myself, like, seriously, you're going to just live like this the rest of your life? Like, hardly doing anything. I, I learned to manage the pain by pulling my life way back in. So the acute pain was was not so bad. But if I did anything much, it would skyrocket. So I thought, I can't live like this. This isn't a life. 
And uh, my son was growing uh, older and was going to be moving on. And he had been helping me quite a bit with laundry, with shopping, with all the stuff that's so difficult to do when you when you have a condition like this and any kind of chronic pain. And I thought, he's moving on. And who's going to open my jars for me? I mean, how am I going to mm-hmm. lift the laundry? Like, seriously, things that so many in who aren't in pain take for granted, just literally like pulling a chair out opening a car door, things that we think are nothing for somebody in chronic pain can be a stopper, taking a shower. I mean, just handling life in itself can be really, really challenging. So I thought I have got to find something else. I I went from one end, which was fighting it to the other end, which was kind of like just sort of putting up with it. There has got to be something Mm -hmm. in the middle there (laughs) that I can find, right? Now, before you tell us that, I'm going to interrupt you for just a second, because I think some uh, some of our listeners are probably wondering, because even thoracic outlet syndrome does sound like it sounds kind of an odd thing. Mm-hmm. And I just have to bring in my own personal view. It's, I mean, I'm so happy that we're actually talking about this, because I can't tell you the time. I'm a psychiatrist, obviously, but people come in with these things. And, and I think it's really important to just tease this apart just a little bit further so people can understand the anatomy and what's actually going on. because. What happens is, and we see this in a cadaver. When I, I originally got into this when I was in medical school, back 19, whatever, 66, something like that. So what happened is when you look at the first rib, the first rib and the clavicle actually come down and are very closely adjacent to each other. Yes. So you can actually, when you palpate right in there, you'll feel that first rib going back and around. And there are actually grooves in the first rib where the arteries and the nerves come out from the spinal column to go down the arm. And that clavicle comes right in there, and that first rib and the clavicle become adjacent. And and I think it's really important to picture those grooves in there, because when it pinches down, it pinches the circulation, Mm -hmm. as well as both motor and sensory nerves. So you have a motor problem, which is what Sarah's telling us about here, where your hands don't work correctly. Correct. You have a sensory problem where you have pain radiating down your arm. And it's very interesting, Sarah, by the way, a lot of people would say, well, what happens if this only happens unilaterally? More often than not, it's just unilateral. You had a bilateral presentation. So what happens, you get a bilateral presentation and what doesn't involve your hands and your shoulders if you're moving around and doing anything? I mean, you're not a worm. Okay, you got arms and legs, you know. So what happens is the fact that you had a bilateral, you had no ability to compensate by using the other side, which some people do because the one side is so completely troubled. So what happens is then you started thinking about this whole thing. But I think just for our listeners, because there are people out here that are suffering with this. Yes. And you can't reach up. You can't reach down. And if you do anything for a period of time, which does involve your shoulders, the muscles of your neck and shoulders pull that situation into closer approximation. So then you have a greater problem than you didn't quite mention this, Sarah, but your hands get cold. Oh, you yeah. Know, you can't feel anything. Then you have your hands are cold and then you have the pain. And as you were saying, there are three layers. Let's just tease that three layer part a yes. little bit because I know people are going to be curious about that. And then we'll go into what you did about it. That's why I interrupted you for a second. So please tell us a little bit about those three layers, if you will. Well, as I understand it, I'm not a doctor, but as I understand it, there's it can affect the muscles, the veins, and I don't remember the exact, you know. Okay. You, know, you, you probably have the exact. Well, vein. that's probably what, I, I didn't know if there was another. Honestly, to tell you the truth, I hadn't heard the three layers. Yeah. I think that's what I was just talking about. Yes, yes, yes. Because you had the muscles, the nerves, you had the pain. And, and the, had the motory. So you had the arteries, the motor on, and I didn't know if that's what you were. I just wanted to hear if you had. Yes, some that's exactly what I was referring to. But and so, so, go so ahead, it's usually compromising when all of those are affected. So I had this kind of super duper version of it. And what that put me in, the position that put me in was kind of like I was left to my own devices because there wasn't, I did try some nerve medication. They don't work so well. It certainly didn't work for me very well gave me a bunch of really unhappy side effects and the list of side effects when you buy the thing and it opens up like an accordion, you know, my son was in the car and he freaked out because 
It's like, mom, you're not going to take that, are you? So I got to try it for one week. That's our, our agreement. But, you know, it gave me worse insomnia, headaches, nausea. I mean, it was not, and it didn't do that much for the pain. So I was really left to, here I am. What am I going to do about this? So I kind of started doing some, I guess, alternative, unconventional ways of looking at this. I always try to think from as many angles as I can about something, mm-hmm. and I don't give up easily. So, and I'd done the stoic thing. I did my part of being the good girl and putting up. Okay, that was done with that. Yeah. <laughs> we had Your attitude was good, but the thing just lingered on. Yeah. It, just, it didn't help. It. it did, you know, I know that yeah. that's a thing right now to I think they call it pain acceptance therapy or something. And I, and if it works for people, awesome, you know, do that. But for me, just accepting it and ignoring it and putting up with it wasn't healing it. And I wanted to heal and I wanted a life back. So I, I thought about, well, what can I do? I can't do hardly anything with my body. How can I work with this? And my surgeon had said, keep your hands near your waist at all times. Well, heck, you know, as much as you can, what can you do? You know, <laughs> hello, you know, you can't do anything. <laughs> I have another thoughtful thing. Wear a straight jacket. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, and, and he just said, you know, every time you're not put them back by your waist and don't reach and don't, you know, okay, that's crazy. That's like a death sentence. You know, you're, you're not living a life and you're in a right. body. That doesn't right. Okay. So I thought, well, I can't use my hands that much. I can kind of write. I can't use a computer hardly at all. The computer is un- unfortunately how I got in the shape I was in. So, but I thought I've written before, like I've journaled for emotional pain. What if I did something crazy and tried to write the pain out of my body? Just express it somehow. It's not moving. I don't know. And it was kind of a crazy idea because it was painful to write. I was really at my wits end and I had to do something and not fall into depression and hopelessness. So I would go to a really lovely bookstore in town here that has wonderful Indian chai and I'd get myself a chai and I'd sit down at one of their tables and I would, I could barely move my neck down at that time. It was very, it was hard to move it right or left. I'd move my whole body to look one way or the other. I couldn't bend it down and I could barely close my hand to hold a pen. So I'd get a big fat pen that moved really easily and I would write with hardly looking down at the paper, kind of scrawl across my feelings about being in pain. And I might be able to write a sentence at a time, literally, before I stand up and move around and then come back. So I might write maybe a paragraph in a few hours, and that's all I could handle. But I wrote about how awful it was to be in pain, how I hated pain, how it had changed my life, how it changed the way I felt about myself, about being a parent, the sadness of it, that all of the stuff that comes up. And I realized that nobody talks about this. There's a tremendous amount of emotional pain that comes with living with chronic pain that there's no space for us to express that. So I just Mm -hmm. spewed it out into these notebooks and it took me a couple of years. And sometimes I would stop for months and not write because I just didn't feel well. I also kind of feel like you have the flu and jet lag at the same time and everything, you know, the symptoms just go on forever. You just don't feel very well at all. But I finally, after a couple of years, I filled a couple spiral notebooks with my scrawl. And in the process of writing how I felt about pain, I also started to sort of think, well, I'm going to talk directly to pain, not just talk about how I, about it. So I started writing dear pain letters and I would say, what are you doing? Why are you still here? I've been so good. Get out of here. You know, writing, writing, writing about that. And then I started allowing pain to write back. Mm. I thought, well, what if pain answered? And in that way, I started a, a strange kind of dialogue with pain, which is also something that we don't do. And in the process of trying out these kind of wild different things, something started to shift. And one of the big things I found was not only expressing it that way, but when I, after a couple of years, had these notebooks with my scribbles in them, I thought, you know, you're going to have to read this. You have to see what's in there because that's part of this. Mm-hmm. And I honestly didn't really want to do that because when you're in pain, you're also trying to not be in pain at the same time. You're trying to live your life and not be where you are. And I kind of realized that might be part of what keeps pain in place. The way we perceive it and the way we respond to it and the way we communicate or not communicate. So I read back what I'd written to myself and boy, I had actually somehow hidden from myself how bad it was. I mean, that sounds crazy because I was in it, but I really saw, wow, this has been intense. And I cried and I got mad and I also felt relieved. Mm -hmm. I was witnessing myself in my journey. Also in there, besides my rants and all this other stuff, was my insights into living with pain and 
And I also developed some ways of being differently with it in terms of using breath. And what I was left with was breath, basically. So I started there. And I thought, wow, there's something in here for other people. So I started to move it into moving towards something that I could offer others. But I think the main things that came out of that time was an understanding that the way we perceive pain, particularly our culture is very pain avoidant. So the first thing we do when we're in pain is try to get rid of it. And sure, that that might work perfectly. You break a leg and you take some medication and you heal. You know, if it's short-term pain, that's that works or usually works. But when we're talking about chronic pain, pain that just won't leave, it occurred to me that part of the reason it's staying around or, or maybe not the reason, but one of the things that locks it in place is our attitude toward it, that we're constantly fighting it and we're treating it like an enemy because of course it's uncomfortable. Who wants it? But it's almost like a no brainer. We think that pain is bad. What? We just accept that. It's like the fish that can't see the water, you know, pain is bad. That's just the ocean we swim in. But I thought, what if I turn that around? What if, you know, having done all this writing and kind of talking to pain, I thought, what if, well, let's think about this. Pain's a signal. Pain's a messenger. Pain is actually me talking to me. What if I listened differently? What if I did something kind of radical and instead of pushing against and trying to get rid of it and just, oh, you know, I don't want to deal with this, I turn toward it in a sense, sort of in an imaginal way, but also in a very real way, just let it be where it was. I thought, what would happen if I let it be there? That seemed scary and like it would just take over. And that's probably, you know, listeners who went, wow, I'm not going to do that. But I found it was already here and it wasn't moving. So what if I did something completely different and turned toward it and said, okay, pain, here you are. I don't like you here, but you're not leaving. So what's up? And begin to change, kind of create a conversation with pain and begin to, I, it sounds crazy, but just that inner movement, that movement of awareness to be with pain differently started to release it. And I was pretty like, wow, really? I think that part of our problem with dealing with chronic pain is our perception of pain to begin with, and that we start with the battle. And we might want to start with seeing pain as part of our natural healing process. We might start with, okay, yeah, we don't have to like it. And we certainly, and I'm not against pain medication or anything like that. I'm not advocating that we, mm-hmm. we uh, yeah. like, enjoy our pain. I'm not saying that. But instead of that being but for a lot of people, pain medication is the only answer we're given when we're in chronic pain. So what if that's just one of our tools, but we also add these other aspects as in being with ourselves differently, being with pain differently, kind of trying to imagine what pain is for. Why is it here? How do we look at ourselves and look at pain with kinder eyes? How can we be more compassionate towards the pain in our own bodies? Again, this may seem really it's very counterintuitive. It seems really strange to people because it's not the way we normally think of pain or normally deal with pain. But I found, and I have lots and lots of ideas for how to do this, you know, how do you do that? But the first thing is to kind of begin a different relationship with pain. And I honestly feel it has physiological aspects to it too. We begin to relax around the pain. We begin to give up the battle so we're not quite so tight. We're not so contracting if we begin to just Mm -hmm. let pain be where it is. I also advocate kind of giving pain more space, which sounds totally ridiculous. Like well, when you say that, what do you mean when you say more space? In a sense of when we're in pain, our, our first response is usually like <gasps> holding the breath <sighs> and kind of contracting, but mm-hmm. trying to stop it. So we get tight around it. We're trying to keep mm-hmm. it in one space. And that seems like, you know, it's a natural response. We want to stop it. But if we then go, wait, wait, maybe that's not going to help and begin to relax around the pain and kind of well, pain, take a little more space if you need it and let go of the contraction. The opposite of what we think would happen, pain begins to kind of release a little bit because we're not squeezing it and we're not holding it as tightly. Also, our breathing pattern changes. And a lot of times we're holding our breath a lot when we're in pain or we're breathing really shallowly. These are just things I tracked with myself over years. I thought, wow, I'm not hardly breathing. Let's look at that. You know, I tried to meditate in pain. That's where it started. Well, that's an interesting thing. When you say meditation, I was really thinking that would be the next thing that we should talk about. I'm going to take a little break right here because there are two things that I want to talk about when we get back. One is I'm just going to very briefly tell you my own thoughts about something that you've been struggling with. 
okay. that you might be helpful for you because it sounds like you still have thoracic outlet syndrome. And so there's some things you could do that you're going to, I'm coming at it from a structural point of view. This is not psychiatry, obviously. Right. So there are two issues. One is what can you do about this pain? And then I want to return and ask you the question, the whole larger issue of pain, and that is what do you actually do about it in some constructive way? How can you actually embrace the concept of pain on a larger level for people who are struggling with pain coming from different perspectives. So what we're going to do is take a break. And then we come back, I'm going to give you a little bit of advice because it may be helpful, it may not, but I'm going to throw it out there. And then we're going to ask you about the larger picture. Go ahead. You were going to say something. No, no, I was just going to say I'm open to everything. So I'd be happy to hear what you have to say. (laughs) Okay, folks, we will be back in just a moment. Today, the world of mind science, psychiatry, and mental health is rapidly changing with innovative, comprehensive testing that takes both patients and practitioners into a new world of measured details with useful, understandable, and remarkably actionable plans. The key phrase here is cost-effective. Testing also introduces a key parallel word, predictability. Psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medications and our brief hospitalizations, arises directly from the complexity of measurable brain-body imbalances and impediments that explicitly interfere with medical outcomes and create costly difficulties with inadequately informed supplement and medication trials over time. Great Plains provides a leadership team of biomedical experts with advanced laboratory insights approved nationally both by the FDA and CLIA laboratory certifications and is available internationally for both public and medical professions. Great Plains Laboratory is the primary laboratory we've used at CoreSight for years with excellent customer service for both patients and medical colleagues. They are on the spot. They get it every time. In addition, they provide exemplary training modules, which are webinars and conferences in an effort to broaden practice perspectives wherever you live. Do follow up on one of these complimentary test offers today at http greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash CBJ. Yeah, that's Core Brain Journal CBJ. Well, here we are back again, folks. And, you know, the physician in me is coming out. And, yeah, I'm a psychiatrist. But my original training, my mother was an osteopathic physician. I became an osteopathic physician. I was actually born in the hospital that she was trained in and trained by some of the same professors that trained her. And her anatomy professor, Dr. Kathy, was the guy that showed me the grooves in the first rib on the first rib and clavicle, taught her when she was in medical school, she graduated in 39. So, and my brother also became a physician. So I did the psychiatric thing, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. But this whole thing of uh, thoracic outlet syndrome and first rib has been of great interest to me. And you may have tried this already, but I'm just going to suggest this for your consideration. It sounds like it would be very good for you to find either a chiropractor or an osteopathic physician who has had some express. See, when you were saying these people specialized in it, I don't think they were specializing it in this way that I'm about to tell you. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Obviously. But what happens is there's a technique by which you can come in And you can take your thumb and go into that space back here between your shoulder and the clavicle and actually push down on the first rib. So what you do is you breathe deeply and actually separate the space between the first rib and the clavicle. So as you breathe and then you exhale and you push down, you actually lower the first rib. Now, first rib problems frequently start from an asymmetry or an imbalance all the way down on the uh, sacrum and the, uh, the body, and it curves up through the spine, and then usually it is compensated for on one side or the other, not on both sides. But you, whatever your maladaptive sacrum and lumbar spine things were, it came up and you were having a problem on both sides. Both of those first ribs would need to be lowered, and there is a specific technique where you can just go in and breathe deeply and it's semi-meditative because, but you also would have some pain because they come in and push that first rib away from that, from the Mm -hmm. clavicle. Mm -hmm. And you can actually fix the darn thing by correcting the upper thoracic region and getting it to move around more effectively. Have you had any treatments like that? 
No, not specifically like that. You'll love it. I mean, it's going to work. It's worth giving you a shot. And you can shop them up over the phone. Just say, listen, have you, are you guys, you're an osteopathic physician. Do you know how to work with first rib and a thoracic outlet syndrome? And ask them, can you do some manipulation for this? Do you know anything about it? Sure. And they'll say, heck, yes, we do this all the time. For example, in this town, I have a guy who is a chiropractor mm-hmm. who knows first rib. And if somebody comes in with it, I send them to him because I know he knows how to do it. So that's something to think about. Mm-hmm. Thank you. A little, little piece of advice. And so let's go back to the more germane because you're talking about chronic pain. And there is this larger perspective that's beyond just thoracic outlet syndrome. Exactly. And that is the whole picture of how a person relates to their pain and the techniques they have. And one of the things you were just getting ready to say when I interrupted you was on meditation. Yes. And so then let's talk a little bit about that because I think that's relevant. That's something anybody anywhere in the country, anywhere, period, can just begin to think about how that relaxation and that meditative experience might help them. Could you tell us yeah. more about that, please? Be happy to. And I think one of the things we're, we're moving toward in this conversation, what we're talking about is including other, all aspects of the self in healing. We have something going on in our bodies. So we think that pain is only physical in nature because we feel it in our bodies, but it affects the whole self. It affects our emotions, of course, especially if it sticks around for a long time. It affects the way we think about ourselves and about life, and and it affects spiritually. It has an aspect of that in terms of the way we see our our identity and also how we relate to life in general and, and whatever we consider to be beyond ourselves. So it's really pervasive, and I think what we're trying to bring in here is other ways of being with pain that include the whole self. We want to not, we're not trying to not include anything that's medical and works for people, but we want to also include these other things that might help right. move things through. So I had meditated in the past and I tried meditating with TOS and I found sitting straight up and down, which is the meditative posture that you're supposed to use, hurt more. And I found deep breathing hurt more. Well, those are the two things that you're supposed to do when you meditate. So that was out the window. So... <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'm going to have to come up with my own version here yeah. and maybe cue for other people that, you know, this isn't just a TOS thing. There are people in pain have a hard time doing things that we suggest they do because it's painful. So I thought, well, pain and, or excuse me, meditation involves the breath. Pain involves the breath too. Everything involves the breath. And I began to, when I was trying to meditate and trying to breathe deeply, I found how painful it was. And then I noticed that I wasn't breathing hardly at all anyway. I mean, it was, I was obviously breathing, but I was keeping my breath really shallow and I was holding it a lot. Every time there was a spike in pain, I'd kind of hold my breath. And I also, so I started following that. I just, I'm somebody that just likes to notice things and, and figure things out. So I thought, wow, how does that work? And then I noticed, wow, I'm not only am I holding my breath, I'm trying to hold my breath to stop the pain from moving. And I'm also, and strangely using my held breath as a wall against the pain, metaphorically speaking, but it was kind of like, can I stop the pain by not breathing? Not consciously, not thought through, just noticing that's what I'm doing. I think a lot of us in pain do that. We kind of restrict our breathing. Well, that's not really going to help healing a whole lot. If, if, if the breath isn't moving and, and the oxygen isn't moving, the blood isn't flowing, you know, that just on a physiological level, that's not a really healthy thing to do. But it's also another way that we're trying to keep things held in. It's like we're trying to hold the pain in place. So I started, I thought, well, if I can't breathe deeply and I can't meditate in a classical sense, can I just work with the breath a bit? And I've had lots of people use these things that I came up with. So I know they work for people that are in pain other than from TOS, all kinds of things, fibromyalgia and Crohn's, everything. So the first thing is to just notice breath, notice how you're using breath to try to stop pain and just kind of noticing it helps it to begin to release a little bit. A lot of times we put our attention on something and it already moves it just by noticing. And then I came up with various ways of working with the breath. And one was, well, if I'm using my breath to kind of push against pain, what if I kind of did the opposite and I just noticed breathing almost with pain, like letting pain be where it is. And kind of breathing with it instead of breathing against it. That mm-hmm. little tiny, tiny, seemingly subtle thought made a huge difference. And all of these things I'm talking about may seem really, really small, but they're things we don't do. And they have a yeah. huge, huge, huge impact. 
Interesting. The way we view pain, the way we are with it, the way we're constantly trying to almost cut ourselves out of ourselves because pain is in us. So if we're trying to pull it out of ourselves, we're us against us. It's not a not really conducive to healing, but it's a natural response because we don't like it. But just to notice these things is massive. You make a massive difference in your experience of yourself and of pain actually beginning to release. So I noticed when I began to release my breath more and just let it be, it didn't have to be deep, just release it a little bit, that my body relaxed around the pain. Well, that was progress in and of itself. And then I just kind of just got creative about it. Okay, let's imagine I'm kind of sitting next to my pain, the worst part of my pain. That time it was in my neck. And just imagine a smaller me or something sitting next to my pain and just kind of being with it and just breathing with it. Very simple, but wow, that in itself, the body begins to relax. Something becomes okay that wasn't okay. It's really simple, but really, really profound. And then I also thought, well, I'm trying to kind of kill pain. We all speak about medication as pain killers. We're trying to kill something. Mm -hmm. what, if we, what if we don't do that? What if we allow pain to breathe? Well, that's a wild thought. What would happen? And I thought, you know, I can always go back to where I was before if it gets worse, right? So I experimented with the idea, obviously, you're still breathing with the same ones and it's you breathing, but you're changing your awareness and your relationship to pain. And the idea of allowing pain to have breath was kind of radical because who wants to do that? I mean, pain was just going to get bigger and bigger and take over the world, you know, it's what feels like it's taking over your life already. But I thought, well, you know, I'm already in a terrible space. So let's let it, let's see what happens if I give pain more space, space, give it more room to breathe. And for me, the opposite happened than I feared. It just was like, oh, relaxing. And I began to see pain. That's what helped me see pain differently is, oh, it's part of me asking for my help. Pain is, is asking for healing. Pain is healing. It's part of the healing process. Why am I against this? And if I didn't have pain, I wouldn't know I had a problem to work with. So it's, can I see it as an ally instead of an enemy? Can I shift this a bit? So there's different levels of kind of semi-meditation with the breath mm -hmm. with pain, but being kind of with it, being next to it, allowing it to breathe and allowing kind of breathing with it. You can you know, experiment with different ways of, of doing that or whatever works for you, whichever one of those works, they may all work. So the other thing I tried doing was breathing into the space outside of pain. That also helped, which makes no logical sense. Don't go with her a lot. <laughs> Try to go there with your logical mind. You won't find it. <laughs> well, explain it just a little bit more. I'm curious about that because that's, say it again, but say it in another way if you can. When, when you say yeah, that, what so would be, before, how would before, you think about it? Before I got brave enough to let pain sort of breathe with me and relax into that, I thought, well, what if I, there is a space somewhere where there's no pain. And I thought, well, it's not in my body, but what if, it, you know, because my body had pain all over it. So, but there's a place of no pain somewhere. So I thought, well, what about, sort of outside of my own body. Now, this is just metaphorical, and yet it does something to think of, yeah, I'll just breathe into that space. And it releases the sense of holding. It just does something. And these oh, yeah, are yeah. all experiments. But you'll find that anything that can release the breath, can help the blood flow more, that can relax the body, can reduce stress, any of those things are really beneficial for healing, healing the tissues, healing, letting healing energy get to the area that needs it. That's very interesting because it really has actually, in a way, you didn't say this, and I think the word transcendental becomes a little bit hokey because so many people talk about it, but it has a transcendent quality in the sense that you're out of yourself and you're in that kind of linear dichotomy that exists between the pain and yourself yeah. because you're actually over into a whole different, larger perspective of how you manage yeah. yourself. Yes, yes, absolutely. And you're also, it gives you a way of including the bigger self. Because when we're in pain, we kind of shrink into the size of the pain. You know, we become mm -hmm. smaller in ourselves in a certain way because pain becomes our entire reality. It, it's just mm -hmm. so demanding, demands mm -hmm. our attention. So it's kind of a practice to say, yeah, that merits my attention. And there's other parts of me. There's, there's parts of me that are larger than the pain that still exist. They're still mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling the pain mostly because it's so demanding, but there's more of me. And that's also something that's really huge and important to reconnect with, especially when we're living with pain for years. We also tend to lose sight of the future when we're in pain for a long time. We forget what it was ever like to be not in pain. 
we begin to identify with ourselves as somebody in pain. You can't remember who we were before. And all of this, if we, it's kind of a way of getting sort of more contracted and more contracted. Mm -hmm, so we mm -hmm. learn, we don't have to, but I think it, it's a good thing to learn how to wait a second. Let's come out of that a little bit more. Let's, pain isn't all of who I am. There's more of me than this. Let's reconnect with that. Let's find a way to find a future. To, and I may have to go through towards my future with pain for a while, but instead of fighting it, okay, let's walk together. You and me, pain. Let's see what's, <laughs> what we're doing together. What is mm -hmm. this path we're on? And how are we going to get through this together? Well, you and, and everything you're saying right now is really a manifestation of exactly what you're talking about. It's, it's a transcendental concept that's taking it away from the binary, from either or mm -hmm. to and. And then you actually have a developmental opportunity there because yeah. yourself is different than this thing that's going on. Yourself is somewhere else and some other. It doesn't have to be geographical, but it's certainly not just there. Wherever it is, it's not just there. Yeah. And then what happens to a person, I, I can imagine that a person could, could benefit from that even with other more general, like you said before, fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is a very generalized pain that's sort of encompassing all over. But if you then think about releasing that and not being at war with it, it's interesting because you're kind of embracing the problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different way of being with it. And, and it's not really the first thing we want to do with pain. We really don't mm -hmm. want to be here. Believe me, I, I, I know that. And yet the pushing and the fighting is, if it's not getting you where you want to go, then this might be something to try. So that's where the pain companion phrase yeah. comes from with your book. Yes. So in your book, let's talk a little bit about it before we close. In your book, do you have specific additional things that you then help? Yeah. You have some specific grids, structural activities. Yeah, I that have a person quite a few things. The whole idea behind the book is that while you're moving through pain, and I think of pain as a landscape we're walking through. That helped me think about that. It's not who I am. It's hopefully not forever. I'm walking through a landscape and it includes pain right now. But if I keep moving and I don't just sit down and become depressed and stop everything, but if I keep finding positive ways to move with it and kind of walk with pain, I can get through to the other side. And certainly mm. it's, it's helped me tremendously. I'm a totally different place than before I started this work. Oh, I would have been able to have this conversation with you. I would have been yeah. so out of it. So, right, right. so what I talk about in the book is I, the first section is, has a lot to do with the really difficult emotions that come up and the emotional states we get into in terms of everything from fear to anger to blame, shame. I mean, there's a lot of shame of, uh, involved with being in pain. We, we feel bad about ourselves for being in pain. We feel bad not being able to heal. Sometimes our doctors don't understand why we're still in pain and we get blamed for still being in pain. That's a conversation that has to change. You need to be, we need to have more medical personnel listening to people in pain and listening to their experience and using that as important an input into how we deal with pain as all the medical training. People in pain need to be part of the conversation. So I feel very strongly about that. But I talk about all of the difficult emotions that we have to live with, the hopelessness, feeling invisible, everything like that, and the stress. And I have um, what I call antidotes, things, ways to work with that. Oh, good, good. Suggestions for each of those that are just very simple, practical, that anybody can use. You kind of sift through which ones work for you, but I offer quite a few ways to stay engaged with life. It's really important to not withdraw and isolate, even though that is one of the first things we do kind of like animals, we just withdraw and go lick our wounds. And, and we don't feel up to being around people a lot. We're really exhausted all the time. And But it's really important to be aware of not making that your pattern over time. So I, I have suggestions for all of that and for people that can't get out much how to deal with that. And then I also go into, I have different ways of communicating with pain, kind of creative ways of setting up a dialogue, setting up a communication with pain to just kind of begin changing our relationship with pain in the body. And that seems to do something. It just, and you can make it fun and creative and it can involve writing. It can involve art. I have lots of different ideas for that as well. And then of, of course, I have a number of the exercises with breath in there too, and how to work with that. Well, you know, folks, Sarah has also uh, blessed us with a PDF, which is going to be available in the show notes where you can download. It's the fear protocol, which is a an abbreviated, free, complimentary, whatever, introduction to what we're talking about here. It's going to give another resource, another opportunity. 
And this is talking about the affect part of it, really the emotional side, as well as the physical side. So it sounds really good. And when that's going to be available in the show notes, if you want to. So in closing, then tell us where we can get a hold of you and what kind of things you do there. You have what kind of things are at your website, that sort of thing. If you can tell us about that. Well, you can find me at www.thepaincompanion.com. It should be easy to remember. I have a blog there and I, I write about living with pain and, and kind of philosophically and also practically. And I also make little, uh, I used to be a videographer before I had TOS. So, so now I'm, I'm relegated to tiny little bits. So I use other people's, I bring in beautiful images and, and music and put them together and make little meditative one minute videos. It's just to kind of help people get through the day. So those are available on my website and, and on my YouTube channel. And I have free resources there and I, I write books and um, the pain companion, of course, is there and you can connect with that. And um, I always love to hear from people. So if you have, if you want to connect with me, there's a contact form on the website. I'd love to hear what people are going through and, and any questions, any, you know, way you want to connect. I'd, I'd very delighted to do that. And I have a Facebook page. It's also called the pain companion. And that's another way to, to connect and to write comments and to ask questions and share. Sarah, do you provide uh, virtual uh, consultations as well? I do work with clients one on one, and you can find that information on my website as well. I work good, with people good. with both emotional and physical pain. So, good. yeah, I'm happy good. to. to that covers it. Sounds sounds great. This has been a very interesting trip because honestly, we've talked to a lot of people, Sarah, but no one has taken this particular position. It's <laughs> sort of like, how do we cut it out? How do we eviscerate it? How do we Lock it up. How do we chew it up and spit it out? And you've really uh, given us a completely different angle on this. And even listening to you when you're thinking about it has a meditative quality because you're actually thinking about, okay, this is a reality and I've got to figure a way. I can't deal with it by just being mad at it and being angry with it. I've got to figure out how I'm actually going to deal with it. And it's really interesting that it actually works. I mean, I hadn't really thought about this before. So I really appreciate you coming on board. If you have something else down the road that you would like to share whether you get another good idea cooking oh, there's lots have more to talk about because you know the pain affects the brain and i know you're interested in that so there's a lots of things we can talk about on that end let's do that let's do that let's yeah. go ahead and, and uh, think about doing that down the road and and get hooked back up and we'll we'll take that trip sounds great i've really appreciated being here today so appreciate the opportunity to share well thank you so much hey i hope that chiropractor or osteopath, whoever it is, does the job for you. We'll see what happens. (laughs) All right, girl. Thank you very much. You have a good one. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive, misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications, like those written for ADHD, are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.